Thank you, Mayor, Commission, Tim Ross, Public Events Director. Uh, air show this last, uh, just, gosh, it's been a couple of weeks ago, but um, we knew this going into this year, we've had a, a larger air show in the last couple of years with uh, you know some of the jet teams that have been in town. And we knew this year was going to be a little bit smaller and uh, we're going to be able to, to save some, some funds with that. And yet still we had a huge impact uh, as far as visitors go and folks down along the riverfront, folks out at the airport. And um, it was a great weekend and we had a lot more exposure from it than I anticipated being a year that we didn't have one of the jet teams. So we still had over 40,000 folks out there over the three days um, between activities. And um, we had media coverage, um, you know, the, the, the military teams obviously draw um, your visit, the majority of your visitors and uh, the, the teams that we had were great um, on their Facebook pages, all the social media between the Air Force groups and the Navy groups, as well as the Army guys. You know, you've got, you're reaching out to just on their Facebook pages to 50, 70,000 folks at a time as they post video after video and comment after comment about, hey, heading looking forward to Owensboro in a few days and the videos that they create while they're here. And so we had great coverage of Bowling Green and Louisville, Lexington. Um, the, the web data is always interesting to me to go back and look at. Most people throughout the community probably don't realize that um, on social media and on web searches, tablet searches, whatever your device might be, both visitowensboro.com, our air show, and even our city website, Atlanta, Georgia, is a huge source for folks looking for things to do in Owensboro. Um, we don't know why that is, but it, it's always been, since we've been doing it, it's number two on our list. Um, you know, Evansville's typically number five or six, but Atlanta is big. We had almost 10,000 web searches for our air show from the Atlanta zip codes, uh, which is amazing. So we had folks looking at the air show from those cities listed, Indianapolis, Memphis, Chicago, um, and it's not, you know, five or six. If you had those up, we, we had upwards of 20,000 web searches on our website from those, you know, big cities that are outside of this market. So. Um, we know that obviously air show is kind of a, a niche thing that some people really follow and we would anticipate that being uh, larger, you know, when we bring the jet teams back like we've got committed for next year. Um, so it, it does help establish the brand here and uh, it's just a good opportunity also to, to honor our local veterans uh, with those military folks in town. There's some unique opportunities for them to, to get some exposure. There's obviously lots of news stories that happen with them. Uh, the military guys reached out to a, a big group from the VFW and invited them out to the airport and, and to thank those veterans for their years of service. So it's a unique opportunity um, for those. So it, it, it um, I guess just to wrap up, it, it was a good weekend and it surprised me what the numbers were and the response we had from folks and the coverage we got knowing that it was kind of a down year. Um, we posted right away the, the, the dates that we've got for the Blue Angels um, coming for next year, September 14 to 16. And uh, they've got a winter visit that's coming up that'll be uh, on their calendars in just a few weeks and we'll get some media exposure from that as well. So um, air show was, it was a good weekend and uh, it did what we're trying to do with numerous events, whether it's barbecue or July 4th or the air show, whatever it might be, romp, um, that, that uh, all take services and support from lots of different organizations, but helps the local folks um, for quality of life and, and brings folks in from out of town too. So I've got Mark uh, Kalitri with the CVB is here today as well. He and I meet regularly and talk regularly about things. And so he wanted to give a few, a few words of perspective about the air show weekend as well. Thank you, Mark Kalitri with Visit Owensboro. I just wanted to expand a little bit on what Tim was saying. Uh, we've reported that the uh, two main hotels downtown had strong occupancy during that weekend and the courtyard out on Highway 54 also had some pickup there as well. Uh, going forward, we think that this events like this could be a better opportunity for us in our office. We need to capitalize a little bit more, be a little bit stronger, a little bit better on helping to brand Owensboro and letting the communities uh, throughout the state of Kentucky know and the cities that throughout the state of Kentucky know how awesome and cool Owensboro is so that's going to be my <coughs> commitment for next year is we're going to spend more dollars and more efforts uh, getting that word out and um, just kind of a big picture of where we see things going you saw the article in the paper Owensboro's you know a top ranked city for Millennials and cool events like the air show and things like that that that's what folks are looking to do and that stuff helps brand what we are and who we are so we're going to continue to capitalize on that for next year okay. thank you thanks mark any can we have questions from the commission about it sure show? anybody have anything I, I do if nobody else does i don't want uh, i'm just curious uh how did the forty thousand number come about 
I yeah. know it's always a question. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, a combination of things. It's uh, gate receipts, um, gate counts out at the airport on Friday night from those activities, and then just crowd density. Yeah, Bobby said that was very well attended. Yeah, it was. It was, again, we were surprised with the weather was really good, and um, we know high school football depends on the effects that attendance, you know, every fall, depending on which teams are home and which ones are away. But it was a, it was a home run out there, and it helped the airport folks. Uh, and then the rest of it for um, Saturday and Sunday downtown is all based on crowd density that we meet with uh, the OPD guys, the traffic division, and they look at um, just how thick the crowd is, how long it takes for the ingress and egress of parking and folks um, compared to other events that we do, like the July 4th of the barbecue and things like those. So Slow down, Timmy. You're talking too fast. I can't keep up with you. Pam and Bob just keep nodding like, okay, yep, I'll slow down. No problem. <laughs> but that's what it's based on. It's uh, feedback from crowd density and egress and ingress. And sure. In comparison to other festivals, is that correct? And, and in other previous years as well. So we talk with the fire department and police department, and we put our joint collective uh, heads together and look at it and say, hey, in comparison to previous years or other events, we're, we're right in this range. So that would have been double what you did last year. Yeah, last year we had uh, rainy kind of gross weather mm -hmm. Friday and Saturday, and, and we still ended up, I think we were around 25,000 last year um and then this year with uh without the jet team so that's that's where we come up with that estimate okay um why is it the same show saturday and sunday that's based on the military folks when they come in they um when when those teams come to town it's different according to which team it is which branch of service it is and what they pay for and what they don't but when they commit the resources of the aircraft and the personnel um, to come to those cities they want um, as much exposure for their branch of service because it's all about recruiting um, as well as uh, community involvement all when they do shows all over the country and so they uh, require there's certainly exceptions to the rules if they do a flyover at one of the big NASCAR races or things like that but um, they they want or they weigh heavily on it being a multi-day show so they get exposure to larger crowds and um, we know from whether it be ticket sales at the convention center or just online folks that come um, they want to know if there are multiple days because of the the ball tournaments that Johnny and Susie have got on Saturday mm -hmm. and they can't get there because they're traveling, you know, with with a travel ball team, but they can get there Sunday. So, but the reason for two days is based on the military groups and wanting the exposure for a longer period since they're here. Okay, um, I have to ask costs. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you raised a considerable amount of money from sponsors, and and I'd like to know exactly or close to it if you don't have those figures you can get it to me some other time but i'd like to know what the costs were sure. was for the city of orangeboro police fire public safety sanitation all the things that went into it versus what we actually what revenue was generated for it. sure yeah we can get those two we're still okay. waiting on some invoices from some of the equipment companies and things like that but um once we get those we'll certainly be happy to share those I, I, it was a very, very great weekend for sure. And uh, Mark, I got a couple of questions for you, please. When you said strong occupancy, what are you comparing that to? Do you have numbers of what a normal weekend would be? Is that how you do that? We're comparing that based on last year, year oh, last year results. Year. So the double the crowd, double the occupancy then, I guess. It didn't actually, yeah, it wasn't a double the occupancy, but it was, uh, it, for instance, the uh, Hampton Inn was probably close to 90%, 95%. Yeah. And then, um, you, then you have to compare what kind of sporting event or what the weekend was last year. But when we're saying stronger over last year, it was compared to that exact same weekend last year. So, so you weren't comparing it just to a normal weekend. Right. But it was compared to the air show weekend last year. Yes. Okay. Great job, thank you. Anybody else? I just I don't I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I was at the Static Air Show, and I thought it was terrific. It was very well attended, and um, the Hueys and the Cobras being there, even though I didn't pay the money to do it, I know a lot of people did, and uh, tying the vets in. So thank you both, uh, particularly Tim and your staff, for a great job. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All right, thank you. Next item, Mr. Ross, uh, open container policy. Sure, open containers. I know we've had um, questions from um, commission in the past about what's even possible with open containers uh, here in the Commonwealth. Um, we look at it somewhat regularly. Uh, there are cities all over the country that do it differently. 
and um, some folks have got open container um, regulations in place and they'll open up a river walk and they uh, on a local level are able to change um, some ordinances to allow for a little bit more loose regulation of those um, but currently here in the commonwealth there's only two opportunities um, for cities within the commonwealth to have um, uh, a, a looser regulation of open containers to allow open containers by state regs by state regs yes open containers on public spaces streets parks sidewalks things like that the two there on the screen uh, entertainment destination center is what they refer to on the state regs as an edc um, not economic development but entertainment destination Mostly. center exactly um, it was confusing as we as we researched that but they refer to it as an edc uh, and then the second one is a temporary license. So currently these are the only two options that, that we have for that here uh, in the Commonwealth. What's so, the definition of a temporary license? Uh, I will get to that. Excuse me. No problem. Um, so I'm going I'm to walk through. I already said it. I'm trying to keep up with it. You know, go I'm going I'm to talk through both of those definitions and give you examples of both so, so sure. we understand that to make sure we're just trying to share what restrictions we've got. So the first one, Entertainment Destination Center, uh, is, is referred to as a, as a themed complex destination. Within that is required to have a themed restaurant. Doesn't define what that is, but something you know, like a rainforest cafe or a hard rock or you know, a, a destination type of, of eating establishment. It contains retail or theater or a concert hall or a museum. You get the idea of what they're going for. It's a, it's a, it's a complex that contains entertainment aspects. Um, an entertainment destination center also has to be located within one mile of a tourism destination such as a convention center, performing arts, uh, a, a key anchor in your community. The entertainment destination center also requires a minimum of 100,000 square feet of entertainment complex buildings. So it cannot be just a big park space. It's got to be something that contains what we referred to in that last slide, 100,000 square feet at minimum of theaters, retail, restaurants, concert halls, museums, that type of thing. And it also has to have pedestrian, per pedestrian protection. I'm fighting this head cold too, so it's kind of hard to talk. <laughs> pedestrian protection from vehicular traffic. So you have to limit vehicles. So as an example, uh, most people, when I moved here years ago, um, always referred to 4th Street Live in Louisville. We want to be 4th Street Live. And if you look at a map, just an overview aerial there of 4th Street Live, um, it is a destination complex that contains restaurants and bars and shops. It's all contained within around a city block per se. It kind of shares two blocks. 4th Street, they completely block to vehicle traffic. So that is an EDC within the Commonwealth and the normal open container laws of the state don't apply as long as you're within that red highlighted area. So you can purchase an alcoholic beverage from Hard Rock Cafe and walk out onto that, that portion of 4th Street that is closed to vehicle traffic and stroll up and down the sidewalk and go visit a retailer or another restaurant. That fits that definition. Um, we here in Owensboro don't have anything like that currently. Um, we don't have a place that's got 100,000 square feet that's in, in a defined space that contains that amount of square footage of retail, restaurant, etc. So the next option is going to be a temporary license and we have several events that take place um, throughout the year uh, that request a temporary license from the state and are granted that. What the, the photo there is white on second that the symphony's done several times where they close a portion of second street uh, and do a fundraiser. Uh, the barbecue fest and their the beer garden area there at McConnell Plaza is a temporary license. So temporary license can be requested and applied for uh, by nonprofit organizations or if the event is defined as a civic event. So anything that benefits the community and if the city, Steve Lynn or, or Ed or myself sign off on a letter that says this is a civic event for the betterment of the community, it's helping our, our, our community in one way or the other, we can request that temporary license. Uh, it does require boundaries to be set up to ensure that no alcohol comes in or no alcohol leaves the defined space. And then here's the kicker, is that it also requires that liquor that is purchased from one licensed establishment cannot cross into another licensed permit holder's space. 
So I'll define, I'll, I'll give you a few examples here to kind of help explain that because that's where it gets to be problematic for several events. So here's an aerial view of our downtown. On the left hand side, the big white box is the roof of the convention center. Then on the far right hand side, the smaller little white box is the River Park Center, right? So if we decided, if the commission decided, if the event decided, for instance, hypothetically, River Park uh, uh, talks to Friday after five, and Friday after five says, hey, we wanna be wet zoned the whole space, the whole river walk wants to be a wet zone space. So River Park Center, now highlighted in yellow, already owns a liquor license full time. You can have drinks on their property, right? So they could fill out a temporary license request to define the rest of the river walk Friday after five space, however they wanted to define it, and request a temporary license. So if me and my significant other were down at Friday after five, we could buy a drink from River Park and start walking down uh, the river walk with our drink in hand. However, once we got to the convention center, we would have to throw that drink out because the convention center already has a permanent liquor license. So my drink could not cross into convention center space. If I bought a drink at convention center during Friday after five, I couldn't now walk onto the river walk because River Park Center's license is who requested the, that temporary license. Does that make sense? Because sure. one, you only have one, only one entity can request that temporary license. So as the growth continues along our riverfront, if Barbecue Fest, for instance, decided that they wanted to expand and allow alcohol anywhere within the defined space, and not just in McConnell Plaza, you have Lure, that's now highlighted in blue at the Hampton Inn. They've got their own separate license. VFW's got license. Bluegrass Music Museum is going to have one. The Enclave, we would assume they haven't announced what restaurant. They haven't announced which restaurants, but you would assume <coughs> maybe one of those has a, is going to have a, a license for alcoholic beverage. And you've got Feta, and you've got Gambrinus, and you've got all these other CYO groups that all uh, the new um, Bar Louie that are all gonna have their own licenses. So from a practical standpoint, if the mayor's down there with Barbara and they're walking through, how do you enforce where you purchase the drink and where you didn't purchase the drink? It becomes convoluted, a little bit problematic for enforcement of that license based on the current restrictions that we have from the state. So that's the challenge with the, the temporary license and why it's been done currently the way it is with our different event folks. The symphony, when they do their event, I didn't highlight it on this, but the white on second, they have a defined space of just second street from Davis to J.R. Miller. They're bordered by buildings on the north side of the street and they're bordered by First Baptist for a portion of that south side of the street. And so they have security guards on the east and the west side and they can ensure that no alcohol comes into their space with their tables and chairs and no alcohol leaves. And there's nobody else within that space that has a permanent liquor license. When Barbecue Fest does it at McConnell Plaza, there's nobody within that defined space when they put up their little bike rack fencing so they can ensure that no drinks are coming or going, it's just their license that they pull. But if we expanded that and you start to get into the other established that have them full time is where it becomes problematic. So that's how a temporary license could potentially work on a riverfront, but the restrictions that we've got with that, because so many other groups have got their own full time licenses. Some of the other concerns that we would have, obviously we take direction from the commission moving forward, but currently um, underage drinking, you know, if you went to the first example of Friday after five, there's a tremendous number of youth and OPD would, would talk about that. There's a tremendous number of youth through the middle of that riverfront park space. And so now trying to ensure that youth are not drinking and who's got drinks and who doesn't and the wristbands could be problematic. There's a playground in the middle of that space. Um, is that the image you want for the, the, the younger kids in the playground? Obviously you'd have to set up boundaries and staff to ensure drinks aren't leaving that space depending on how large you make this, the area. And then security and enforcement would, would be a concern. So those are the two different uh, types of licenses currently allowed by the state. The, um, the destination center or the temporary license. And those are some of the kind of hypotheticals that we talked through as a staff to go, in this situation, how could it work for us here? And unfortunately, we're not allowed to do things like uh, the only two EDCs that we're aware of, 4th Street Live, and then um, up in Newport. Newport. Uh, Newport on the levees, got it. 
But again, it's a destination that you drive up to and it's kind of its own complex and everything's contained within that complex. Um, but there aren't any other cities that, that uh, we're aware of that have that current designation because of the restrictions that are currently on it. Okay, could I ask city manager a question for the <coughs> home rule folks that you've been <coughs> meeting with all these years? Is that ever, is this, in, I'm looking legislatively or regulatorily somewhere to try and massage this rule so it, you know, could, it could fit into what we want to do. Has that ever come up in your discussion? Never come up, Mayor, but I have a meeting in November that I'm attending, and I'll bring it up there. Because I think that's only our only uh, relief is to try and get uh, option three. Sure. Yeah, currently, it just the way it's defined right now, we don't have that complex destination. We've got a tremendous riverfront that brings thousands of folks down, but I don't see it changing drastically to be able to fit the, <clears throat> the definition right now because we're not going to build a big entertainment complex with theaters and restaurants and shops in the middle of that park. It mm -hmm. might be adjacent to it, and some of those pieces might grow, but it's not going to be one complex. So the definitions would have to change on a state level. Well, we'll um, I'll speak to folks and, and see just to, you know, exactly what the interest is in Frankfurt for uh, some of this activity. Uh, you know, I had thought maybe we would try it as a pilot study from River Park um, during Friday after five, mm -hmm. you know, just for the labor, uh, Memorial Day, Labor Day, and see what kind of problems we went. But that shoots this, that shoots that in the head pretty easily. Right, and, and and again, you could go back and do a temporary license for just a portion of that space. So, because we looked at this on the one Friday after five event when low cash was going mm -hmm. to be here, and they expected that larger crowd, and we talked this through ad nauseum with several different groups. But um, again, the way it is currently. It's not insurmountable, but if, you know, Commissioner Condor and I were down there and, and we had a drink at River Park Center and you saw people walking down the river walk, we would just assume, no matter what signage is up, you would just assume that I could continue walking to the stage at the convention center because it's part of Friday after five. All right. But the current law wouldn't allow us to. So we'd get down there and we'd go, what do you mean? I had the dump. I just paid $4 for a drink. You got to dump it out before you can step foot on my side. And now as again the the restaurants progress once the enclave opens up or once bluegrass museum or lure we couldn't step on foot onto lures little patio space without potentially if abc came back to lure and said hey look at you now we're going to cite you or fine you because you're allowing outside drink to come in because the assumption is that i can go from one to the next because i can walk through that space but the temporary license does not allow for that crisscross and that's well, where we got stuck with and i think it's protection too you know as much as anything else it is I would say Blake probably wouldn't want 50 people coming with a drink in their hand all of a sudden going to the convention center to go to the bathroom or That's whatever correct. you're going to do. So and even from a liability standpoint, liability because if standpoint they come back and well. they've had excessive drinking and they were on property at yours and something happens, or if they left yours, mm -hmm. but they were yeah. consuming a lot before they got on, so there's potential, certainly. Okay. Any questions? Just have one quick one. Uh, so Mr. have you calculated the law enforcement element? Would we need to have more officers? Would they have to have any special training if we were to go this route? Uh, it would be something that Chief Elam could talk about a little bit more exhaustively, but it, at the current time, whoever the temporary license holder is is responsible for that security. So, for instance, for, um, Barbecue Festival, they hire the extra duty folks through OPD to monitor the, the, the temporary license that they've got for their event. When uh, the symphony does white on second, um, they hire additional security to monitor that closure for it. So um, again, depending on how the regulations went, if, we, if it allowed us, the city as a whole, to, to wet zone that whole space, then yes, it would become something that OPD would have to take into account from a budgetary standpoint. But on a temporary side, if Friday After Five wanted to do it, then Friday After Five would be responsible for having volunteers and or security to monitor those entrance and exit points. Mr. Smith, right, you had your hand up first. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. Right. No, it's no big deal. Um, I was just, Mayor, I, I think that this is something that, you know, I would appreciate if you looked into because um, with us getting this status of the millennials and all of that stuff, you know, it's important that we have certain things in this, in this community. And I know I've been uh, uh, labeled as the alcohol pushing commissioner, and that's, you know, whatever. But the point is, um, whether you choose to drink or not, that's your business, but there are people who do drink. And uh, I think that at, at a, at, there's a point that we uh, uh, would be more inviting to 
tourism to a lot of things because when I've traveled to New Orleans to Memphis and you see these people I know it's in an area but they you know Bill Street whatever they they're walking from one place to the other and a lot of the places say hey you can't if you come in with a drink you are uh, required to buy one drink here I mean you know there's a one drink minimum you know there there are things that you do to offset some of this other stuff but I, I do think it's worth looking into thank I'll you look into it and you know Tennessee might have a few different regulations you know they're not very smart down there so and I will, I, I will say this just to add on to what she said you know you would mentioned a pilot program earlier again we take direction from the Commission but one of the cities that we've looked at has a river walk that they've been developing for years they finally got it developed and they have open container limitations that wouldn't allow for that they've got um, I think it's about eight restaurants that are adjacent quote-unquote to the river walk space so they got permission to start a pilot program like you were mentioning and some of the enforcement of that is each of those restaurants has got certain designated cups and again you could get around that but they change out every I think it's every six months and so if you've got a drink up and down that space unless it's in one of those designated cups then you can be cited or you can be asked to put it out or you know whatever so there's some limitations around that that um, you know that you could be creative with if the state would allow us they don't currently yeah. but certainly there, there's other references that you can get from other states if they ease those limits a little bit Commissioner Smith right and, and some of the other things you know like there there are no no uh, glass containers Correct. they're all in plastic or whatever so that there's you know less chance of somebody getting hurt with bottles and that kind of thing so. the only thing that it doesn't it, it doesn't um, the underage drinking is, is still the concern with it that you w with the amount of youth that are in ours compared to some of those other destinations like uh, you know yeah, but we've got, I mean, you know, you've got kids that are drinking without this even going on. Sure. And I mean, and you, you know, that's, that's a whole nother problem. But it's, in, in my view, right this minute, there's some kid somewhere that's drinking and shouldn't be. So, you know, it's. Would it be appropriate, Art, uh, uh, Chief, would you like to address the public safety side of this just briefly to kind of give us, I know I've talked to several police officers and some of them say, you know, it's nice to have them all corralled in one corral, <laughs> corral. corral. And it's, you know, rather than to see a 25 year old guy that you think is of age and he's not and vice versa. So I, I would appreciate your opinion, please. Well, I mean, the obvious concern for us would be youth. I happen to attend a youth alcohol seminar training in Boise, Idaho several years ago and they talked about the serious problem they had with youth drinking. And they took, gave us a tour of downtown and they actually had the streets blocked off and it was just, you know, bars and people walking back and forth drinking. And I was like, well, there's your problem there um, because it's tolerated and uh, in your community, for one, you know, I'm open to anything, but the concern is this, that you all have to consider if we do this, there's no easy way to stop people from coming in to downtown. So we'd have to have officers everywhere. Our overtime budget would quadruple at a minimum if we did this all summer long, like Friday after five, going from Friday after five, the River Park Center, all the way to the convention center. So that is an issue. There's also star training where, you know, it's yeah. uh, that bartenders and waitresses, servers have to attend this training. Uh, to in order to serve alcohol so you know with that alcohol being brought into a situation think about a movie theater how many people actually pack their own snacks into a movie theater happens all the time mm -hmm. and, and you don't have you know we don't have enough officers to check everybody's and we can't by law just go pat people down to see if they're packing in a pint of vodka or whatever so those are the challenges that I see in terms of opening it up for everyone just because you can put up a, a barricade or what have you, but that's not going to stop individuals. You get three or 400 people trying to come into an event. Uh, we don't have enough police officers, nor would these uh, event uh, people would, be yeah. able to staff it to where they could prevent people from packing alcohol into and out of. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, right? You'll be attending the KLC meeting tomorrow, today or something? Are you going? There are board meetings? No? Okay. I'd start with J.D. Cheney with KLC and see if, if this has been brought up to their people and uh, just kind of no reason we yes sir and mind you another issue I mean we've got a lot of youth downtown 
So, and some of which are unruly. So you start co-mingling people, packing alcohol back and forth, drinking, getting heavily, you know, under the influence, uh, intermingling with some of these um, youth that have no respect for law enforcement or, you know, adult authority in general, <laughs> that makes our job that much more complex. So, I mean, it's a much bigger issue than just, you know, allowing people to drink okay. in a public setting. Yes, sir. Commissioner Condon. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. Uh, Tim, question for you, please, sir. The temporary alcohol license itself, that's done through the um, ABC here in City Correct. Hall, through the state. How Correct. much does that cost? What does a temporary license cost? It's, uh, I don't have the exact number in my head, sir. I, I, it's a couple hundred dollars. It's not horribly expensive. I think it's, it's less than 100, if I remember correctly. Steve, do you remember? I think it's I less than 100 for our city version. There's two. There's requires a local one and a state one. Right. If I remember correctly, I think our city one's under 100, and I think the state's right around 100. But it's, I, I believe it's less than $200 total. It's, then, it's not very expensive, but I could get that information for you. And in conjunction with that, I assume you want to have a special events permit also, right? Correct. If yeah. you move in that Correct. Direction. If, if they're doing that, they've already got typically a special event Correct. permit. And a special events permit is how much? Uh, there's no cost for that, just the expenses of what required city services are required for that, <laughs> whether it be trash or tables or chairs or electric and, you know, if they, if they need support from us. Sometimes they come in and they're just using the space and they don't need any services from us. So Friday After Five or any other non-for-profit civic activity, the cost that they have up front, $200 for the license fee, if it moves forward in that direction. And then on top of that, they would be responsible for sanitation or anything else and providing their own security. Security. To be able to do everything that's uh, applicable to that special event. If Correct. And insurance would be the other one. You know, if, you, if they go out and get event insurance to do, if CareNet's doing their 5K walk or run, they have no liquor liability insurance required on that. But if they want to host, like, the symphony, uh, uh, the rate's going to be different according to what underwriter that you've got, but certainly your insurance rates are going to go up noticeably if you've got that liquor liability coverage on your insurance. And most of that is what is called like DRAM insurance that some people have to buy? Correct. And that can get very, very expensive. Can be pricey, certainly. Okay. And, and, it, and again, it's different according to what the entity is. You know, it could be a few thousand dollars. It could be less than that depending on what the scope, if you're trying to cover annually or to cover it just for a particular event. So there's lots of variables there. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Commissioner Glenn. So if the dream occurred where you go from River Park all the way down to the convention center, you have to shut that street off, right? There can't be any traffic. Because 4th Street Live, they don't allow traffic. I mean, I've been, That's there, correct. been there. That's correct. Is there a cost associated with that? And if you do an EDC as opposed to a temporary license, is there, Commissioner Connors talked about cost, is there an additional cost for infrastructure, putting up walls, rerouting your streets, anything like that that you're aware of? No, not that I'm aware of. The, e the way the EDC is, is you can be defined as an EDC if you meet all of these different requirements. And um, so one of those would be limiting vehicle traffic. It doesn't define the times that that vehicle traffic has to be limited. Um, but currently, we, we always allow vehicle traffic, at least on a portion of that. Um, and certainly, the more often we close that, the more often we get feedback from businesses that some are love it and some don't like it. Um, but, so that would be one thing, but currently we just don't meet that requirement um, to even be defined yeah. as an EDC. So that's kind of a non-starter issue. So, but costs of it, it just depends on which one you do and whether or not the event promoter is taking on those security costs and road closure costs, or if it's a city function and, and who assumes that, that liability. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mark. Yes, sir. Um, oh, get your water? I got a little bit. All right. Thank you. Tim Ross, food truck operation. <coughs> food trucks, um, we, let me forward through the slide. Mobile food vending. We started a pilot program here in the city back in 2014. There was an ordinance amendment uh, allowing for expanded use of mobile food vending here in the city. Uh, in our city limits. And uh, we looked at numerous different things. Uh, food trucks are a national trend, as it says there, that certainly add vibrancy. Uh, and the goal is to bring additional pedestrian traffic to the core, wherever those food trucks are, or keep the pedestrian traffic. Um, it started in the much larger metropolitan areas. And rather than city workers staying inside their cubicle, 
in their high rise. They wanted to get them out on the city streets or what, as opposed to them leaving to go run their errands, keep them downtown uh, as much as possible. And uh, there's certainly times when the uh, brick and mortar restaurants were overloaded and people just simply don't have 20 or 25 minutes to wait to grab that sandwich. So the mobile food trucks were a quicker option. It's kind of how it started. Um, it continues to grow. It's a $1.2 billion industry nationally. Um, one of the things that um, numerous cities were concerned about initially is um, losing brick and mortar restaurants as the food truck industry continued to grow. And it's showing as a trend nationally over the last 10 years as they've looked at it, that in most metropolitan areas, the, the food and restaurant and catering businesses have continued to grow, even as mobile food vending has continued to grow in their communities. Um, two examples, Austin and Seattle, thriving food truck scenes with very few limitations in those cities. It's kind of, those two are some of the, the um, kind of kind of guinea pig base studies for, for food trucks, and yet their catering and, and restaurant businesses have grown at 16 and 18 percent respectively over just the last six years in spite of very few limitations for food trucks. Um, so so that uh, kind of goes against logic there with those cities. Mm -hmm. We've referenced numerous cities as we've looked at it back in 2012, 13, 14 when we did the amendment. Um, we've looked at those same cities again in addition to a few extras. And um, some cities are uh, very liberal and have very few limitations on them because they feel like it helps drive traffic and keep folks downtown. Other cities restrict them noticeably more, that they've got noticeable setbacks of 200 feet from any brick and mortar business. They've got a lot longer restrictions on hours. Uh, a lot longer restrictions. Some, some cities only allow a food truck to be uh, at one location for no more than two or three hours uh, and with larger setbacks. So you have the whole gamut of no limitations. Some cities allow them just to park on public property with no charge, no anything, and other cities very drastically restrict them. So what we did in 2014 when we came in front of the commission is we looked at our downtown core um, that currently didn't allow any mobile food vending. Uh, on a regular basis and we tried to come up with something in the middle and that's what we presented the commission that they voted to start and that's why they did the ordinance so starting back in 2014 uh, we do allow mobile food vending um, those four items you see there are all required city of Owensboro business license they've got to provide insurance health department permit as well as mobile food vending uh, permit it's um, they can get all those things here at City Hall the costs for them it's two hundred and fifty dollars to get a mobile food vending permit that would allow you to have your ice cream truck, your barbecue truck, your whatever you want your truck to be uh, here inside city limits. Uh, if you want to vend and on a regular basis within the downtown core, it's an additional $400. So it would cost you $650 a year just for the permit um, for the city. The ordinances we pass requires a drivable food truck, not a towable cart. Uh, that was something that was debated back several years ago when we did the ordinance. And uh, the trend is towards the food trucks because it's a, a couple of reasons. It's a larger investment. It's not something that somebody could go buy for five or $6,000 and, and you know, start making regular income with. And uh, the comment was also made that we didn't want it to look like a carnival or a festival atmosphere downtown on a regular basis. Um, so they didn't want the typical carnival style trailers or, or small little hot dog carts. So the current ordinance requires that drivable food truck. Um, there are limitations to it. One of the things, I don't remember if it's on here, but I'll say now so I don't forget, is that um, all of this ordinance is outside of a special event. I think I have it listed there, so I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. But um, it allows uh, parking on any streets. The times are listed there from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. Um, they can't be parked in any one space longer than five hours. Um, they cannot park within a thousand feet of any school unless you've got the permission of the school. Um, there's no food vending adjacent to one of our city park spaces. Amanda in our parks department had concern that, um, and it was a regular battle with her that uh, ice cream trucks were parking, you know, at the park. A, it takes away potential revenue for the city and the, and the concessions that we've got or the vending machines at parks. And if you take, um, your children to the park you don't necessarily or want to have to fight and argue with them that no we're not buying ice cream no we're not getting you know a funnel cake no we're not getting getting nachos we're just going to play at the park so we don't have anything adjacent to our current park space because that is what the commission decided at the time um, it also protects like i said our concessions and the revenues that we've got based on those 
Um, there's currently no parking within 100 feet of any business whose primary business is food and beverage. So you can't park within 100 feet of the door of the, pro the property line of FEDA or any of our other restaurants. And these permits are outside of special event. So for Friday after five, when they pull their special event permit, if you've got a trailer like several of our businesses in town do, they can participate and be a vendor at that event because there's a special event permit that's in place. Um, we've got a map that's posted on the website that shows the limitations downtown and um, vendors are permitted currently on private property. We don't regulate what happens on private property in any way. So if U.S. Bank calls curbside kitchenette, which is one of the trailers in town, it looks, it's a great looking truck. They've got great food, but it's not a drivable truck. It's a towing trailer. So if U.S. Bank calls curbside kitchenette, which they do once or twice a week, then curbside kitchenette parks on Owensboro or U.S. Bank property and sells to all of their employees during lunchtime. And uh, they do that with Atmos and with um, Boardwalk. Boardwalk, numerous ones do that. So on private property, we have no regulations at the current time. Currently the map for downtown, here's the, the green spaces is where mobile food vendors are allowed to park and sell during that 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. time frame. The red space is adjacent to our Smothers Park space. All the little red circles show defined restaurant locations currently. There's some that are gonna be opening up over the next year, but limitate, limitations where you cannot sell or vend within those red spaces. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, we got a question, Mayor. Commissioner smith right. Can, can you go back a few slides? Just wanna see something. Back again. You were looking for that one with the sweets, aren't you? That's what I was looking at. That yeah. truck that had the, all the donuts and everything in it. No, no, no. Oh. Okay, okay. There it is. Right there, right there. Street sure. sweets. That's what yeah. I Oh, that one. On. No, I wouldn't talk about it. Okay. Now, Real Hacienda. Yes, ma'am. That's right there in front of the Hampton Inn. Yes, ma'am. And Lure has a restaurant right there. Correct. So th was this a special permit? permit for him to, to yeah, do that I, I believe that photo was during july 4th or no well, or, excuse it, me it, it was might during, have been the air it show. was doing the air show because july 4th the stage was parked because right i there, could look so. down and see yep. it right there I, yeah i believe that was during an air show so but, there was a but my question is issue. people have our, our business owners have said to me that they resent the fact that these uh food trucks are parking so close to their restaurants and i mean i don't know if you have to have a, a, a special permit for like the air show, then that's okay. But is that okay just like today if he wants to go down there and park? No, ma'am, it would not be because it would be within 100 feet. And yes. so when we do it for the larger events, there's probably, gosh, off the top of my head, maybe five times, five days a year that there would be a special event um, to that magnitude that we would have them adjacent to those. But if the other map that we've got shows that would not be permitted because okay. it is within 100 feet of their okay. property line. Thank is, you. is correct. Uh, Commissioner Condon. Uh, just my quick comment. If you go back to that slide, what is it, 33, I think, Tim? So with the map? With the map, yes. Sure. You know, seeing your red dots, you know, personally, the 100 feet is just, it's not enough, really, in my opinion. If you're going to restrict, um, because you will have more that's going to be developed on veterans and the convention center. You know, you don't have really a red dots around the convention center, actually. Uh, so it's going to happen more and more um, and I do know that one of the first questions a franchise will ask when they call to want to come into our community though checking their box they want to know do you have a food truck ordinance and if you check that box yes they want to see it because they view future food trucks franchises as competition direct competition at a much much lower cost per square foot to build out their brick and mortar um, and I have heard a couple of them have called recently and have denied coming into Owensboro simply because of they that chose to, they chose, they chose not, not to, to come in. They weren't that denied by us, right? They were not denied by us, but they chose not to uh, because of these type of limitations, especially the hundred feet. Hundred feet not being long enough for for them to sell their business. That might, that's my only comment. Is that universal 100 feet or did we just make that up it's not the, mo the one of the most restrictive cities is actually chicago and um they've got very little food truck uh in their downtown core any of their which their downtown's massive i understand that but uh, their limitation is 200 feet um and yet if you look at austin and seattle that were listed on there they don't have a limitation that setback is is 100 feet or less and yet their brick and mortars continue to grow 
um, it's interesting that, and I would completely understand it if I had a restaurant and I was looking at downtown, but yet we don't have any food trucks that go park downtown and vend regularly ever. How many do we have currently? There's there's only two right now that are drivable food trucks that that oh. are um, that currently meet the ordinance that even oh, could go should. down there. So they're regularly down, like you said, at Boardwalk. They go regularly. U.S. Bank. They go regularly um, with all the events. You know, during the season, uh, as we call it, that um, between Friday after five and the Saturday events, they're down there regularly on the weekends. Um, but they're not down there at lunchtime. Rarely are they ever down there. Does this pertain also to a nonprofit that want to drag a hot dog stand around too? It's the same deal for them. Yeah, they would be a per they'd be allowed at a special event if there's a permit issued for that special event, and they are in agreement with the event organizer. Um, but they would not be allowed down there during the normal work week. Okay. Commissioner Velada. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. To uh, kind of resound what uh, Commissioner Condor uh, talked about earlier, I've, we're seeing a lot of these, and who enforces this? I mean, we're seeing a lot of violations, and, and I deal with it daily because of the type of work that I do with trying to get new uh, restaurant franchises into our downtown corridor and even on highway 54 for that matter or wherever that case may be around the city um, I see a lot of trucks that are set up at local businesses right next door to restaurants and they're not trucks they're trailers that someone set in their parking lot and who who is enforcing that I mean is that something that OPD has to accommodate or how do we I mean I'm not going to go around and call everyone because there's several on a daily basis around that aren't doing that and, and another prong of that is we have um, restaurants in other cities that have food trucks that come in and I understand it's a special event uh, come to Owensboro for Friday after five for 16 weeks out of the year and they're up here doing well obviously or they wouldn't make the hour trip from Bowling Green and they almost it's, it's ridiculous trying to get them to commit to a to a lease or to build a brick and mortar somewhere because why would they need to they've got the food truck option uh, if, if there's anything otherwise where it's a little more restrictive maybe we could capture that uh that revenue and get us another restaurant here that we need downtown in this corridor sure yeah the, a couple of things currently there is no regulation on private property so they can set up on they could go to meyer meyer law office every day and just if meyer meyer decides to sublet sub sublease their <laughs> parking lot and allow them to set up there there's there's currently no ordinance or regulation against that um, same thing that was um, and not even just for food trucks, right? You know, the, the, the gravel property right at the corner of Allen and, and Veterans had a, a Gulfstream trailer that was like a little boutique, yeah. something, you know, for Set a year and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there is no regulation against what goes on that private property. But we could fix that. Uh, Possibly. Mm. I mean, Maybe. adjust the ordinance to make it a little more restricted for things like that to where it's not such a permanent situation i mean i'd have to go back to legal to see what we yeah. can what we what we're allowed to do on private property or not and, and certainly go ahead steve we could certainly take a look at that and, and report back to you i mean i know we currently issue the business license and for these uh, portable vehicles that uh, i'm sorry uh, you know they are uh, depart health department regulates as well but could certainly look into the issue of uh, regulating on private property we do that for the brick and mortar restaurants mm. okay Thank just you. keep it i mean my question is i just want to make sure that everybody's got a fair playing field here you know we're, certainly we're talking about someone that's investing in your community compared to someone that comes in a few weeks out of the year makes his money goes away and that restricts this guy that's put his neck on the block to make a living here as a restaurant owner sure and and i and i will say on that i know we get comments regularly for some of the biggest events that we do like barbecue fest where they're bringing in lots of different food vendors I'm sure a lot of those are from out of town folks um and it helps that that event um, as an example, when we do air show or Friday after five, uh, a lot of the vendors are the same for July 4th and air show and some of those because uh, A, it looks cleaner and it, the, the time for them to set up and tear down is much quicker than what we used to have with all those tents and portable grills and stuff that are set up that are um, sanitary, is, it's a lot better in the food trucks. And so from the air show, for instance, of the, I think, 15 food vendors that we had, I think 10 of them were Owensboro businesses and five of them were from adjacent markets. I know Friday after five is about 75% of those are local businesses um, within the county or the area. We, it's a separate event, so we don't manage their vendors, but I know they've got a lot of the same ones that we use for air show on July 4th. So the majority of those are all local businesses, but yet they don't meet our current mobile food vending because the majority of those are all trailers. So they can't set up on a regular basis only during those special events. And Friday after five, as you mentioned, is 16 times uh, in, a, in a year when they do that. Commissioner Glenn. Quick question. 
So what I've noticed is Gene's Health Foods has a truck, Real Hacienda has a truck. It seems to me, and I, I respect what uh, uh, Commissioner Bellotta is saying about brick and mortar, but it seems to me like most of the food trucks I see, they're already existing businesses. They, they've got their skin in the game. They're already, Real Hacienda has two locations here. You know, Fire Up the Grill does our vending out of the college and they have a truck. So what percentage of those who have a license um, are existing, they have a brick and mortar operation? Yeah, the only three that we currently have are the ones that you mentioned that, okay. that meet the mobile food vending. There's numerous other ones that have trailers, but Jeans, Real Hacienda, then Fire Up the Grill. And Fire Up the Grill actually doesn't meet this restriction either because they always cook their food outside of their truck. They need additional space, so they bring out the portable grills and such. Uh, but Jeans and uh, Real Hacienda have got food prep and cleaning and everything contained within their truck. So there's really only two that meet the current ordinance the way it stands that you and I could go down there for lunch tomorrow and they might be you know sitting on the corner of Allen Street someplace. Other than that, besides those two, everybody else would have to be part of just a special event. So when Making Strides Breast Cancer Walk happens in a few weeks, if they wanted to reach out to one of those and said, "Hey, we need, you know, we want to have a, you know, a, a frozen lemonade thing here because it's going to be hot that weekend." I thought you were going to say tacos. Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> for, for the, the big walk. For, yeah, exactly. That's for the American Heart Walk. Um, but if they wanted to do that, that would be something that they would reach out to individually uh, and do. So, but there's only two that currently do it, and yes, both of those are, are restaurants or you know businesses in town. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome, uh, City Manager. Can I just ask you? Why is this on the work session? What prompted this? There were two commissioners that asked that we bring this forward for study. Just informative, not to take any action, just to bring it today that might generate discussion amongst the commission. Thank you. Okay. How do you control their cash intake versus a credit card? Would it be easier to manage their revenue for the city if they had to use a credit card every time? We don't have any mechanism that I'm aware of. I have to ask finance. I don't think we can regulate how they sell their product. I'm just curious. That I'm aware of. And that's something that's come up with festivals or fairs or whatever it might be, you know, over the years. But I don't know if we have a way that we can regulate how they take payment. Well, I'll ask somebody smarter than me, than I. Mayor and commissioners, um, it, as far as regulation of how they accept payment, we, we have no control over that. And whether it be a mobile food truck or a brick and mortar building, you potentially could have those same concerns on ha taking cash versus using a credit card and if sales are rung through register versus not rung through. So, um, you know, that is not something that would be easily regulated, nor do we have the authority to regulate. At this time. Uh -huh. Just curious. I mean, one for me and one for Mama and one for Billy and one for Jane and one for Uncle Sam. You know, I just kind of understand the cash flow business there. Okay, anything else for Mr. Ross? As always, excellent presentation. Thanks, sir. Appreciate you bringing us up to speed. He's not going to do leaf season two? I'm so disappointed. I'm done. No, he's done. <laughs> hey, my head's down. <laughs> I, I didn't know you knew how to get here. I was kind of worried about it, man. It's been a while. GPS is a wonderful thing. It is, it, isn't it? It, it helps us all. Well, you have the floor. It's all yours. Mayor, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Downey Ward, Sanitation Manager, City of Owensboro. Leaf season time again. <laughs> Rough timeline next week is your last time on your normal trash day to get your limbs, your loose limbs out for collection next week on your trash day. Please get them out. Uh, we take twigs and small stuff year round. So if you bag it or put it in your own can, uh, that'll be fine. So next week, 16th to the 20th, we actually start uh, sucking leaves on the 24th. We have an orientation on the 23rd, Monday. Uh, the Tuesday on the 24th, we'll start vacuuming leaves uh, throughout the city. Is there a difference between sucking and vacuuming? It's just a perspective <laughs> type of thing. We, pre we prefer vacuuming, but sometimes <coughs> the other one applies. Sometimes you suck. Yeah, so. Levity, I like it. Sometimes you feel like a nut, you know, and sometimes you don't. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that the uh, leaf collection will go through the 15th of February uh, when we will run, return to systematic uh, limb collection but in that time uh, the two months out of the year we do suspend uh, loose limb collection uh, rough guess as far as uh, 
you know, when the, when the first passes are in the past, you know, you see roughly about 16 days for us to get through. The tonnages vary depending oh, on the yeah. rain, the amount of leaves, everything else like that. So it's just how the chicken bones roll out as far as to <laughs> estimating what kind of tonnage you're going to get from year to year. I've been doing it for 14 years, and we haven't figured out a way to predict uh, when the leaves are going to fall. Or the chicken bones, right? Or the chicken bones. There you go. No offense to any chickens out there. <laughs> just rough predictions on uh, what we usually collect you know, in the past years, anywhere from <laughs> 2 million to 4 million pounds. It, it varies. Uh, it just the last three years, it's been fairly consistent. Um, you know, and, and not one of these leaves threw themselves into the backs of the trucks. We actually have to go along and pick them all up. So it's quite a bit when you consider the individual weight of a leaf uh, that we get the two to four million pounds. It's quite a lot. Danny, where'd you get that white car behind that Volkswagen? <coughs> I'd prefer not to answer at this time <laughs> without consent. Mm, Go ahead, Commissioner Connor. Do you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> Go ahead. That, that caddy's awful look, nice looking right there. <laughs> anyway, we'll start in Section 5 this year. The city is divided up into 10 individual leaf zones. We advance it one, uh, one section every year so that nobody feels left out as far as, you know, you always start in uh, a certain section. You always ignore us. So we advance it one year. Last year was in uh, Section 4. This year we'll be starting in uh, Section 5. Rough estimate, don't hold me to this, but this is just kind of a rough estimate when we think we'll get done with the first, second, and third passes. Um, you know, again, it varies by weather, uh, equipment availability, personnel availability. A lot of fa factors uh, affect the way, you know, how quickly we can go. And then a transition period, uh, usually about January, we can start to reconfigure a couple of the trucks to back two chippers to where we'll start hunting and pecking and trying to, to get some limb piles, you know, in that, in that transition time before we're back to full systematic on your trash day limb collection uh, middle of February. Collection options, the uh, quickest way to get rid of your leaves is to bag them up and take them to the orange dumpsters uh, that are residing at the sports center. Uh, again, leaves only, no grass, no trash, um, but you can get rid of them or have your uh, leaf or your uh, mowing guy pick those up and, and take them down there uh, however you want to do that but that's the quickest way because you get them off your yard uh, right away and you can take them down to those uh, orange dumpsters at the sports center uh, the next quickest way is to bag your individual leaves we ask that they be no more than 30 pounds a piece because of the variation in the quality of bags that may be out there any more than 30 pounds once it gets wet turns into about 70 pounds and we end up redecorating the lawn with your your bag so 30 pounds or less sending it out on your trash day uh, and not to block your regular trash toters with them but just to, to put them out there and we'll get uh, get rid of those on your trash day the slowest way uh, slowest way to do it for loose leaf uh, is the individual leaf vacuum uh, considering that we have to go down every, you know, two sides of a street, basically, along the curb line. Uh, that is the, the cleanest way we can do it if your leaves have cooperated and fallen when they're supposed to. Uh, but that is the slowest uh, way to get through um, it, the collection area. Ensure quality service. Uh, again, we uh, ask that you keep at least uh, the cars at least 10 feet away from your, your leaf pile. And if you, if you know we're in the area and you don't like dust on your car, please don't park on the street whenever we're in your area collecting leaves because it's a dusty, noisy environment. We can't really control which way the wind goes. Um, so uh, again, we just ask that you not park on the street. At least give us at least 10 feet of clearance uh, whenever you do set your leaf piles out there. Don't mix brush or trash with leaves. We find all sorts of things mixed in with the leaf pile that shouldn't be there. Axe heads, railroad spikes, cans, uh, <laughs> all manner of things. And uh, the, uh, the vacuums will dutifully, I mean, they're, the impellers are spending at 1400 RPM sucking 24,000 cubic feet a minute. It will suck up whatever you put the nozzle over. So whatever's in there that shouldn't be there, It'll suck it up, but it does a little bit of damage and it gets your attention right away. So we just ask that you not mix anything else with the leaves instead of, you know, just, just the leaves out there. Don't wet them. Uh, I know that keeps them from blowing around, but it just slows our job down because we have to kind of fluff them up to get them to, again, suck up into the, the vacuum hose. Don't cover up <laughs> obstructions. 
uh, water meter lids, uh, anything else uh, that may be on the ground that we may uh, step into or onto that you value. Uh, Reiki leaves curbside. We, we say that a lot of times you'll see our guys sweep the, uh, the leaves out into the street. It makes it easier for our collection purposes. We just ask that you keep them curbside though or up in the lawn until that time. If we do have a rainstorm or something like that and you've got them in the streets, it goes into the storm sewers, it blocks the drainage and everything, and that's exactly what we're not, you know, we're designed not to do. So the, the whole big uh, aim of this whole thing is to keep the leaves out of the uh, sewer system to improve the drainage uh, and less flooding. So four million pounds of leaves uh, in the sewer system is what we're trying to avoid. So anyway, leave them up in your yard. Don't block the sidewalk if you can, but, uh, and then again, just be ready when we come by. Uh, watch the uh, website, newspaper, certain radio outlets, Channel 75. Uh, keep up or call us to find out where we are. Uh, you know, about a week before we get there is a good time to rake and get that out there so that we, uh, we can get it on the first time and get out of your way. And that's it for Leaf Brief 2017. So the main reason is to keep them out of the sewer? Yes, sir. That is the main reason. Curb appeal is a secondary uh, effect there, uh, but the main thing is just to keep them out of the sewer system. It's a part of the litter, litter abatement process and it just to increase the drainage. What's the cost of your leaf pickup? Overall cost, manpower, equipment, all of it, it's, I, I could get you a number. It's just mostly uh, just the individual, individual uh, you know, paying the temporaries because we hire 13 temporary personnel, That's plus full time personnel Temps. like that. I wouldn't even have a guess. Okay, just curious. I thought maybe over the years you'd just say, well, it cost us less this year because I could see the tremendous difference in the numbers of uh, tonnage or whatever it is from 400 and something to one, down to 117. Right. So, and needless to say, the quicker we get it done, the, the cheaper it is because your personnel costs are some of your bigger costs. The equipment is around to, for dual purpose. You know, the, the same trucks that we use for leaf season are the regular chipper trucks. They just reconfigure slightly. So, you know, all the other equipment are used for other things, but we do uh, plus up personnel wise uh, to help us with the, the manpower. Yeah, you don't want to be sucked up into a chipper truck, I can tell you that. Hmm. Okay, any other questions for the leaf operations? Nice to see you, sir. Thanks nice for being to be here. Seen. And not viewed. <laughs> okay. Item number. Uh, Six is the city project list. Uh, is the city manager here today? Yes, Mayor, you have those uh, in front of you, that report. We're prepared to brief by exception. I will note, though, that our chief operating officer, Ed Ray, is out in our, our CFO. So we have to get back to you on some of these. We're ready to, to give it a crack. Okay, any questions from the commission? Commissioner Condor? Thank you, Mayor. Um, parking garage, Mr. Parrish? Yes, sir states that the uh, parking garage architect has completed drawings and bid package when I saw the, the ad in the uh, messenger inquiry this weekend for that bid package is now available when the architect was who is the architect for the parking garage please do you know that do you go ahead please uh, ponder its integrity architecture and there do you know where they're located Lo local? Um, I do not know that for sure it's not local um, don't know that for sure okay. I don't know that for sure and do you know if that was that entire project was our an RFP was sent out for bids that come they come back and they get to select I, that? I do not know that for sure. Um, it is considered professional services, so that is not necessarily a requirement to do that. Um, I do know that. Okay, and this was I assume chosen over a year ago uh, to do all this design work and everything else. For I don't know when that happened. Do you know when that that occurred? Uh, Selection you, of the architect and everything else. I don't know that. I'll find out. Moving to the TIFs, two TIFs, stating that the uh, looks like the $20 million minimums have been met. Um, so does it look as if we may be activating them very soon? Uh, Ed and Angela have a plan for that. I'm not uh, aware of what that date is. I'll get that for you. And then finally, the uh, Bluegrass Music Center. Would it be possible we could get a tour? Just to see, we'll, we'll ask for that. Like. Certainly, I've, I've had a tour. I know we can. The completion date of that is scheduled for June fifteenth. And have they had that restaurant yet? 
I do not believe they do, Mayor. When are they going to get the windows up? Commissioner Villada. Uh, oh, sorry. Windows, uh, I drove by yesterday, and the windows are going up and back now. Okay. What about the front? Looks foreclosed on the front. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Commissioner, I'll find out when the windows will go in. Thank you. Commissioner Glenn. On the uh, Highway 54 development, it appears they've got their first big building up. You can see it from the bypass. Uh, they look like they're putting street lights in to go into Hayden Road. When will, do we have any? I know that's a state project, but do we have any idea when that'll? Because that'll really change traffic flow. I mean, we've got all these there with their extension. And I, I, dro entrance. I drove that yesterday, Mayor and Commissioners, and looked at it and looked at that building as well. I'm doing a tour with some fifth and sixth graders here later this month. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll attempt to find that out. That'll really slow traffic on 54, another light sequence. So I'm, I know they've got to have it. There's no way to get in and out of there without it, but thanks. Okay, anything else for the staff? Denise, sure pleasant to have you here today. Steve, city manager, you have anything else? Anybody? No, thank you, Mayor. Staff, thanks for coming. Oh, move to adjourn. So moved. So, so